This is the captain of the Enterprise. Ship ship. Podcasting. The Final Frontier. These are the ridiculous introductions I am forced to read at gunpoint. Or should I say, phaser point. Welcome to Ship to Ship, yet another in the long line of tedious Star Trek podcasts. The show is hosted by David Lawler and David B. Anderson. The two Davids will take you on a journey through time and space every three or four weeks, boldly podcasting where no podcast has gone before. Seriously? This is what you're making me read? Take it away, boys. What, you stupid bitch? <laughs> That's a good way to begin the show. You know, I, I just want to say something. Um, yeah. All the screaming, all the yelling, all the cursing, all the belching yeah. and spitting, you never wished me a happy anniversary. I just spent <laughs> well, 20 amazing. years, 20 years with my wife. This woman shares my bed. She disagrees yeah. with me, and we fight all the time. Yeah. By the way, I'm well, st- you. straight as an good... arrow, straight as an arrow. Although sometimes I see a guy, and I'm like, hey, that's a good-looking guy. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, right. welcome so to— we're doing um, Star Trek now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ship to Ship, a Star Trek oh, podcast. A whole bunch of—this is a whole bunch, and this is actually going to be a gonna, two-parter. Well, it's probably going to be like a five-parter the way we're going to go on. Five-parter, okay. Because we're going to be talking about time travel stuff. This is what we promised a long time ago before Anderson went on his sabbatical. And— um, so, like, the first thing would be uh, the original series, and I wanted yeah, to talk. Yeah, the original series. Yeah, will you, will you, because I did watch, I watched everything, but I've already forgotten half of So if you just say what the episode is, then I'll remember. Well, it's The Naked Time is the first one. That was a very early episode from the oh, first yeah, yeah, season. Oh, yeah, yeah, and that was something that I was not aware was, even though the time is in the, uh, is in the description, I was not, I just, for some reason, I didn't re- remember it as a time, because it kind of is, but it isn't. It's I mean, not, do like yeah, little... it's not a, t- it's a time travel episode by accident at the end. At the of, very of end, what they happens. accidentally do something. And also, uh, everybody just thinks of it as, like, to K with his Yeah, with to K with his sword. shirt, I'll protect you, fair maiden. Um, now, you, do you remember that Next Generation did a sequel to this episode? Very, it's yeah. It's very first episode in production. Naked Now. The Naked Now, which is basically, it's just, it's really weak. But, Going into the story of this, all it hap- what happens is there's this weird um, uh, virus that spreads among the crew as a result of complex water molecules that somehow change, and they, they act on the blood like alcohol, and they make everybody um, es- essentially drunk. This one guy, Kevin Thomas Riley, who was the helmsman or something, or navigator, I think, and he goes and he turns the engines off. He he, he locks the door to engineering. I mean, it's so bizarre how a bunch of weird things can happen that you can well, I noticed, completely I noticed capture when, the ship. When the thing gets on him, they, I could already tell like they were doing some sort of weird effect where it was it was kind of dripping sideways, and they just sort of shot it sideways so it would right, drip on. Right. That's what happened to the first guy who gets it. They bring him up, and then he he goes crazy, and then he he basically stabs himself, I guess, with a knife in the um. And we're we're not yeah, having the most, dinner the most or something. Key pink looking blood I've ever seen. <laughs> it was it was uh, but it was fairly disturbing. And then uh, McCoy starts working on the. Actually, you know, I think McCoy and and uh, let me see, McCoy and Scotty and Hora are the only ones who don't seem to get affected by it because they're too busy. Chapel does, now. When was this shot? Because this is Chapel. It was her first episode as as nurse as Christine. Yeah. Because I'm, she they they were changing her hair. She had like full like weird gray hair thing going. I don't think she was like fully gray at that time. I, I don't think it was gray. I think it was just more platinum than anything. It seemed silver on the thing I was watching it on. It's it, it's it certainly wasn't. I remember her having dark hair after that, right? Well, no, she she was a blonde up until the final episode, I think, of the mm. show. Until when she, I guess, she just said, "Fuck it, I'm not I'm not dyeing my hair anymore." Okay. So so she went she went full brunette like she usually was. And mm-hmm. then, and then, of course, when she shows up again, uh, well, in the animated show, she was blonde again. But then she shows up again in in the movie, the motion picture, and she's got the brunette hair. And in the, and also, she's we find out early she's in love with Spock. Yes, yes. I, but to be fair, it might have been just the the, the disease that kind of. Because you know what happens when you get well, you're not a drinker, but basically no. when you get drunk, you know all your inhibitions kind of go out the window, and you yeah, that was the whole point of they say they say it releases your inhibitions. So whatever these people are feeling, yeah, is is what's the, whatever they're pushing back. So it's, and it's a great it's, it's it's a great character piece, but for me, I mean, it's a great episode, wonderful, but comes up a little too early in 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 the show because we haven't really gotten to know our characters yet this is a very yeah. early episode well, 
I but, noticed like watching watching this, and then I think the, the the one after that is also in the first season. Yeah, and then watching the third one, which I think is in the third season. Yeah, yeah is yeah. it? I you notice the dip in quality of money and just general script writing. Oh yeah, yeah. But third season is I I do love all of these episodes though. I thought the third one was really good too because it was a nice little love story for Spock. But we were, mm-hmm. we're talking about naked time. We're going to talk about yes. tomorrow is yesterday, and mm-hmm. and all our yesterdays. But uh, but naked time is is really great because it shows the crew like it's it's more of a collaborative effort. I think I think when Roddenberry first came up with the idea of Star Trek, he wanted it to be an un- encompassing piece, not just the story of Kirk or Spock. And so he created for some very interesting characters. And you'll notice, I mean, that sort of carried over into Next Generation. Next Generation was more about the ensemble. So you have this, these, you have Kevin Riley, who's a very interesting Irish guy. He gets all crazy about his Irishness. You got mm-hmm. Sulu, who takes his shirt off and, and goes around with a, uh, with a foil and starts, you know, threatening his fellow crewmates and thinking that yeah. he's some kind of a three musketeer. And he grabs her whore at one point and he's like, I'll protect you for a maiden. Um, and then uh, what happens to, okay, Christine suddenly in love with Spock. So she's like, I'm in love with you. She, gets, she infects Spock. Spock mm-hmm. has a complete and utter nervous breakdown. It's a great performance by Nimoy. He talks mm-hmm. about how he can never tell his mother that he loved her. And, and he says, uh, Jim, when I feel friendship for you, I'm ashamed. And then he smacks Kirk, sends him across the table. And then Kirk gets all uh, emotional about how he's in love with his yeoman, you know, Janice. Janice is there too. Janice didn't get affected either. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, and I realized watching it, I'm like, now you would think the 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 sulu with the with the fencing sword is is sort of an iconic moment yeah and 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 then of course they even reference it in the the 2009 star trek movie Mm -hmm. with sulu and i realized putting that in the in the movie is it kind of makes sense because i I, I barely remember that i i I do remember now you uh, not only does he fence he mentions that he's like uh well what weapon do you have uh what what do you know how to do fencing and it it totally makes sense in that movie because that's that's younger Sulu, and in this this is a first season episode, the first one that they made. You said, um, this, no, this or, this was I believe the fourth or fifth episode produced. Okay, but it's I'm basically saying it's early on. Very this early. Is an, yeah. This is an early character moment, and he's he's talking to the other guy, his boyfriend. I don't know. He's talking to the <laughs> other guy, and and he's like, yeah, and fencing, and I do this, and this is so I'm like this this is a sort of a central character thing so to have that in the movie it totally made sense. I always thought oh, that seems kind of random even though it's, it is an iconic moment it seems you know like a pick and choose yeah but when you really think about the that is a sort of a foundation character trait it is so it I, is. I find that interesting and he's uh, you know he's, he's just wonderful I think I think very early on they had these great ideas about how to write these characters and and they did it in such an interesting way. And again, I was looking, you look at science fiction from this time, 1966, 67, nobody was mm. doing stuff like this. This was, this was next level, you might call it, you know? Yes. Um, so then uh, McCoy eventually finds a cure. Uh, but because Riley has stopped the engines cold, they have to figure out how they, because they're, go, they're spinning, they're, they're going down in an orbit, and they might collide with the planet and the atmosphere, blow up yeah. the ship. So they have to start the engines cold. So they just they do it, and it. it I, I guess it's such a an incredible unleashing of power that it causes the Enterprise to travel backward in time. They go so only a few fast. minutes or something. Right? Only only a few minutes or something. It's well, it's a few minutes, but it's three days. So oh, three days. Okay, yeah. Okay. So and they I, go back now, in time, like? and it's a what time warp. Like? What did this look like on the original broadcast? Because you know, I watched like the remastered version oh the original you know i mean it just looked kind of you know for the time state-of-the-art visual effects for television but as we look at it today if we were looking at the original it would look kind of chintzy because there's sometimes where it's like if you see like the original and then you see like the remat the remastered helps you to kind of understand because a lot of times they'll show a special effect it'll literally be like the ship like 
flying around or something. Yeah, like, yeah, it doesn't yeah. really do anything. And so you don't even know exactly what's going on. And so it's they, just when they all it is is just all you see is basically, I mean, like they don't even show the ship in the original. They just show the star pattern going backwards. It's, it's, all right. It's, this is good enough. I mean, I prefer, I know it's an unpopular opinion for a lot of purists, but I really do like the remastered versions much better because the visual effects are so much better. I mean, like, and again, they help you understand what the hell is going on, especially with Tomorrow is Yesterday, which is the next episode that we're going to talk about where they do the slingshot around the sun. Um, so my thoughts on Naked Time, I really, I, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. It was very funny. It was actually very funny, despite the fact that there's some, there's a suicide in it, you know, mm -hmm. but I did enjoy it. You? I did too. Uh, I, when I, every time I watch these, especially first season, I'm like, this, this is solid science fiction. It really is. This yeah. is. They're they're actually attempting to now. Of course, they got kind of sloppy there near the end. Well, they tried but... they tried to avoid cheese, and cheese was essential to science fiction back then. Like you look at Lost yeah. in Space back the the original Batman, Lost in Space, Batman, I, Batman, I was... all that kind of stuff, um, and even Twilight Zone could get cheesy on occasion. Uh, but yeah, they were really trying very hard to to distinguish the show from other things, and NBC never really. Uh, they they didn't want it to get so they, they didn't like spending the extra money because they actually hired technical consultants from universities and think tanks to look over their scripts and see is this plausible can we do this does this make sense to you and they would write it up and we see them really like, see the, a reason for for spending the extra money on that for research you know mm -hmm. <clears throat> this, this was you know this was this was Desilu money mm-hmm hmm. Ooh, Fanta. Don't you want a Fanta? Um, <laughs> okay, so moving on to Tomorrow is Yesterday, which is a little bit later in the first season. It's written by Dorothy Fontana, one of the great writers, of course, script survivors. She died recently, um, a couple of months back. And this is this episode provides a lot of the basis for um, for Star Trek IV, a lot of the science, because they did it before. He mentions it, and this is where they did it. It was accidental. They were drawn, I believe, toward the sun, and the sun caused uh, caused the ship to move closer and closer, so they had to snap back from the sun. And they wound up going back in time to the late 1960s. They get discovered by a, a Air Force jet. They try to hit the tractor beam on it. They wind up destroying the jet. Mm -hmm. uh, but they bring aboard the pilot, which is Captain Christopher. I just realized this is reminding me of, I mean, we'll talk about it later. This is reminding me a lot of what happened in the Voyager episode. Um Re you kind of have a guy, and then and then he's there, but then he forgets, and he doesn't know, and it kind of resets the whole thing at the end. Yeah, yeah, of, yeah. They, yeah. They, we'll, that. we'll that's that's that. that whole thing. I, you know, I always had a problem with that kind of time travel storytelling because it, it's a weird. Uh, I, I love paradoxes. Like we're, we were going to talk later about Next Generation Time Zero and the paradox of Data's mm -hmm. head always being in San Francisco. Um, I have a problem with like things like the Terminator. The Terminator the original movie makes very little sense to me because uh, John Connor as a full grown adult would have to know who his father was and his father, the father would be Kyle Reese. So John Connor sets the, the, the events in motion where that result in his birth, which is just kind well, of, he knows it and he knows it. But I, if I remember in the original Terminator, he's, it's like he figures out like, this is why he sent me. This but, is why he sent me. He knew. But the thing is no one ever explicitly says that though. It's just this thing of, John well, actually, Connor being an adult. Says it. I think she says it at the end in her recording. I mean, how would you feel if you were Linda not. Hamilton and then Michael Bean shows up and says, hey, baby, guess what? We got to knock boots because I got to make a baby with you. What do you say? Well, it wasn't quite <laughs> like that, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, okay. All right. Anyway, but I do enjoy paradoxes. They, uh, so the problem is some 19, late 1960s technology. They've, they've spotted the Enterprise. They have film. They have to remove all. First, they have to figure out how the fuck to get home. And they do it the same way, a slingshot around the sun. And it's, I, I like the effect in the remastered version because it's, it's slightly cheesy. It's a slightly cheesy effect of the Enterprise going around the sun. It's a lot better than it was in the original. Well, they just, just sort of show this ship like shaking around. Yeah, or it was something. just like sort of shaking. It was like going. Dee, 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 dee. It didn't make any sense. It wouldn't make any sense uh, on any scientific scale <laughs> because mm -hmm. if that if that ship is shimming so much as an inch, you know, people's brains are going to splatter into the walls. But they 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 ex try to explain it away with their gobbledygook or or. And I had to, I, I had to actually kind of rewind some things because I'm like, what just happened here? Because kind of at the end when they when they kind of fix everything. 
And then because the guy, the guy that they beam on, it's like he shifts allegiances like four times in this episode. Like, well, yeah, because shows- because the idea is, OK, it's, it's so ridiculous, too, because Spock doesn't it's it's a very sexist idea, too. It's incredibly sexist is that he's got daughters and because he has daughters and they're girls, they're not going to make any impact on the future. But then he finds out, oh, he's going to have a son later because and there's a very cute moment where he says, wait a minute, I don't have any son. He says. You mean yet? <laughs> well, you're gonna get lucky again, punk. You know. <laughs> well, okay. Let's 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 do let's let's do the societal math. Okay, it's 1966. He's got two daughters, so they're gonna they're gonna not have be childbearing until maybe like the late 70s or something. Maybe because you know. That's I mean, but yeah, but but 80. Okay. It's so woman, silly though. It's so silly. Well, My, I'm just saying, you know, and the son will will. Women will, are it, women are homemakers. They're looking for husbands on this show. I mean, it's like what? Really? Well, uh, honestly, we're we're back kind of back to that now. <laughs> I don't know that we are. My, my mother served in the army, and she served in the army around that time. Oh, okay. Okay, she served in the army. And what's more, my my grandmother, my grandmother had it. She was born what nineteen hundred or something? No, no, she was born in nineteen twenty. I'm sorry. No, wait, was she? Yeah, ni- yeah, around nineteen twenty. Okay, my grandmother had a job. My grandmother brought money into the house. They needed money always because people always needed money. It was a bad economy back then. Everybody worked. Women worked too. And here's another shocker for you: your grandparents, David. Yes. They shared a bed. They did not have single beds. They, they we, what no. we saw in television was an idealized version of how people, possibly men, but a woman did write this. I'll have you know, a woman wrote this episode. I, I feel such shame. Well, about I, I can idea. say from personal, my parents. Uh, first, they. Do didn't you think your share. parents slept together? Uh, well, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right we have two children <laughs> we've they had, had to have at least twice, twice. <laughs> yes she was remarkably um, flirt- fertile and they had sex at I, least twice and they did yeah they did it at least twice uh all i know is is that first they they didn't share but be- like from from what i've known because remember they had me kind of late so um from what i remember not to get too personal first they didn't share a bed and then they didn't share a room <laughs> all right all right and I think it came down to, you know... He Did they smirked. do it like like Orthodox Jewish people and just cut no, a hole in the sheet or you know, something? There was a practical thing where it's like, you know, he snored and she farted. So it's, you oh, know... for crying he... in the beer, you know. I, I feel like <laughs> Edit I this out if you need to. Don't, don't. It's just, uh, that's your, that's your mother. Out. That's your mother, David. Um, I, well, hey, I learned the best. I learned, I learned, I learned how to do it from you! <laughs> okay, so... So th- there's some sexist overtones to the whole affair, but then um, Spock figures out your your kid is going to be instrumental in launching some kind of first space probe to Mars or Venus or Uranus. Something, something about your kids. Yeah, it's your kids. Well, your daughter marries a black man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh no. <laughs> That's We're that was a joke. That was a joke yes. from Family Guy. A joke. Um, well, you've lost all your friends anyway. You only it's your kids, you. Marty. What happens with my kids? One of them marries a black man. And he's ah! like, what you? What you're racist, Doc? And he says, no, I'm, I was. I thought, you know. And then he goes, you know that 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 you know I like black people. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you ruined it, Doc. Um, anyway, uh, so they figure they got to get him back so that he can have his kid or whatever. And they they do a reverse application of whatever got them there in the first place, which was start just gun it toward the sun and then break away. Well, no, wait a minute. Before that, doesn't he kind of like? First he's like, I'm gonna stay on the ship. Then he's like, No, I don't want to stay on the ship. Now I'm gonna almost yeah, steal at first, the ship. Yeah, when he he says I'm a, I'm a prisoner in time, the same as you. And then when he finds out he's gonna have a kid, he's uh, uh-uh, you're going, I'm going with you. And he points a gun and all that stuff. And he's trying to threaten. And Kirk, of course, gets yeah, a drop on I'm, him, does a I'm little. I'm foggy on what happened now. They subdue him, but then at the end they beam him out and then beam him back in or something. And I guess. It. Yeah, this is part of the magic bullshit machine, which is basically mm-hmm. that if you. Uh, you go back, so they're going back in time. So they're going mm-hmm. back in time slow enough for Spock to, to note the correct time to beam C- Captain Christopher back into his own body, I guess, at that time. Oh, uh, you know what? That's just like... Uh, that's why this like the, this doesn't make like any the, sense. Like, Well, it's like in the Star Trek movie where it's like they, they figured out how to like beam someone while in warp or something. Like, you remember that? Like um, it was something that Scotty didn't know how to do, and now he knows how to do it. But it, that was in the, that was in the like the the, the two thousand nine movie. Oh, the two, okay. Because I was like, what? What are you talking no, about? No, it's in two thousand nine movie. Jesus, I like, I, you know, I've only seen that movie once. Oh God damn it! That's an excellent <laughs> film. You got to see that more. I, you know, I the it. the visual effects were gorgeous and everything, and I I do enjoy Simon Pegg, but um, 
No, it's a great man. In fact, to see that, uh, then then watch um, Star Trek Into Darkness and get all pissed off, and then why? And then find yourself redeemed by the third one, uh, Star Trek. Uh, uh, but there's <laughs> okay. So there's a lot of humor. Oh, uh, but I, 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 when you were talking about the movie, for 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 some reason, I flashed on Voyage Home, and they committed the greatest sin in that movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was taking um, Jillian with them because you're making a dangerous assumption about the, whether or not she would have any offspring or whether or not. And the thing is, she, you know, she's a scientist. She would have had some sort of impact on something. She I tries to, she kind of bullshits her way into it. She says, who, who do you know in the 23rd century that knows anything about whales? Come on. And he's like, okay, all right. It's always well, remember, Kirk, they, they Kirk, fuck those. with the timeline so many times with the transparent. Jesus aluminum Christ. So. <laughs> yeah. The transparent aluminum. That's another one. How do we know he didn't invent the thing? Anyway, we'll get to voyage home when we get to it. But, yeah. um, but here they do manage to successfully, and it's it's like a fucking miracle. I mean, it just wind up back twenty third century. Everything's fine. Everything's where you left it, you know. Yeah, it's it's bizarre, and but it's a it's a fun ooh, it's a very fun episode. Even though a lot of it doesn't make any sense, but DC Fontana, great writer, woman, a woman too, by the way, um, kind of sexist toward her own, which is interesting, but maybe she's old fashioned. I don't know. Mm. Um, so, but I enjoyed this. You, I, I did too. Again, it's like when it's first season, I'm like, even if they don't necessarily fully accomplish, you know, great science fiction, you can see that at least they're trying. There's a great moment in there where they arrest Kirk because Kirk got arrested and mm -hmm. Shatner just does this wonderful smile. He just smiles. He's like, "Mm," you know, he's doing this. Yeah, and you can tell it's later in the season because he's a little chunkier Mm -hmm. and it's, it's weird. He doesn't. It's weird. Either's wearing a girdle or something. But it's like just his face gets fat. I've noticed. <laughs> I, well, I guess maybe if you get like, especially if you get into the third season, you can really see it. But yeah, Shatner, you can really see, yeah. Shatner always did a lot of like. He's like a very active physical guy, especially mm-hmm. back then. So he's really built, even though he's kind of you know he's he's kind of small and he wore lifts too. I mean, and the thing is, the lifts did not do any favors for his back, so he would always have this hunched over kind of look in his posture. Mm-hmm. You know, um, okay. So, and then we move on to um, all our yesterdays, which is one of the best. Actually, I know you you said something about a drop in quality, but really, all our yesterdays is one of the best episodes of the third season, and probably one of the best episodes of the original series, just because it it spends a lot of time examining Spock's character and the kind of person that he could actually be. This is a really clever. I think it's really clever. What happens is they go to this planet that's about to be about to explode due to a supernova to see if there's anybody left that they can rescue. And all they find is this crazy old man who runs a library. And yeah, when I watched this, this so much reminded me of maybe they just ripped it off and land of the lost. Like it's, it's all about like, you know, it's kind of like, remember when they had Enoch and he had uh, by the way, that, that episode was actually written by Walter Koenig. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. Now I, I just realized it's, is is uh, is 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 uh oh uh I forgot his name uh, Walter Koenig uh uh Chekhov uh, Chekhov I'm sorry I, I blank is Chekhov even in this episode I'm nobody is in this episode except for Kirk Spock and McCoy and the voice of Scotty I, I think the reason I felt like it was the drop it was like let's do the cheapest one in one location that we can they pro- <laughs> yeah they were probably already striking the sets because it was the end of the this ep- this was the next to last episode. They barely and they barely got that third season too. Yeah, that's true. And what's more, they were they they were on the fence about whether or not they were going to get two additional episodes for the season, but NBC canceled the show. So, uh, so they run across the librarian, and his name is very cute. It's Mister Ataz, which means A to Z. Um, oh, you didn't catch that? No, <laughs> I no. Um, and. He's he's dubious because he's an android. He's, there's a bunch of re- programmed replicas of this guy, android versions of Mr. Atos, to help these people. And what they don't know, what Kirk, Spock, and McCoy don't know, is that there's a device in the library called an Atavacron, where all these people have escaped the destruction of their world by traveling backward in time in the world's past. And this causes problems because Kirk is looking at some kind of disc, a little thing that looks like almost like a compact disc, actually. Um, and he hears a woman screaming, and he goes through this gateway and winds up in, in in the past of this planet in a time of witches, and he is accused of being a witch, and he's arrested. Uh, Spock and McCoy follow Kirk, but they wind up wherever they were looking at, which was the Ice Age. 
So they wind up in an ice age. McCoy gets frostbite. They're uh, they're taken to a cave by a very beautiful Marion Hartley. Um, yeah, it's, uh, when you see somebody that you that you recognize as somebody because we recognize her more from like late seventies, early eighties. I remember Hartley's her mainly commercials from that she did. Those Polaroid commercials, Polaroid commercial, or Polaroid Polaroid commercials, commercials with James Garner. But the, it's like you, the voice. It's that it's that somewhat mannish voice she had. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought it was silky. Maybe oh, even, it was silky smooth, but it finty. was a very. It was it was it was it was not it was not a lilting, <laughs> dulcet tone. It was a, it was it was a little a little on the deep side. But I you recognize it's very recognizable. It's very cultured, I would say. So, but luckily, Kirk gets a friend with the, um, with the Inquisitor, who is also <laughs> one of these people who travel back in time, helps him find the way back home. Uh, they try to find Spock and, uh, and McCoy. Mm-hmm. And Spock is starting to go through some kind of a weird thing because apparently, I don't know, it's a little thin for me. I don't understand how Spock would, would have such a personality change just because his people at the time, Vulcans, were savages. Maybe it's some kind well, of a I collective think he's, psychic he's Literally, thing. he's there and he's reverting back to it. I think that's kind of like the environment is creating, is, is making him revert back. Because remember, all that, all Vulcans... They are basically trained from birth to subvert. Like I don't think they're genetically any different. It was only a few thousand years, so it's just. Well, they have to just, go through colonar and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, they have to do a whole thing. It's and apparently it's, Spock hasn't even done that. He doesn't do it until motion picture, right? Oh, okay. Then did they mention the colonar before? No, that never. Movie? This was this was something new for the movie. They just made it up. At, okay, but uh, it works well. But I'm just saying, like, they never mentioned what the colonar was. Well, according, before. and according to Voyager, as a boy. Like there was a scene in Voyager where Tuvok was a boy and he was taken to some kind of um, priest or something who would mm -hmm. tell him to get his emotions in check. Because apparently, I guess Vulcan boys are very angry and very violent and very emotional. So you're saying perhaps the priest said to him, we ain't found shit. <laughs> I, well, the, it, the thing about it, I mean, Tuvok is a full blooded Vulcan and, uh, and Spock okay. isn't. So maybe it might be. I don't know. This is a little deep. If you mm -hmm. will, if you'll allow me a deep digression. All right. Maybe um, Spock being half human is is best for him. Is best for keeping his emotions in check. Even though, as you can see, he gets really violent with McCoy very fast. He almost he could. I mean, like he could tear McCoy's head off if he really wanted to. Mm -hmm. You know, and McCoy's like shaking him, and he's going, "Think, man, think. What's <laughs> happening on your planet right now at this very moment?" And he's like, "My See, ancestors are barbarians." I think, I think I think I've just summed up our relationship. Uh, you're Spock and I'm McCoy. <laughs> I've lost myself. I do not know right. who I am. Uh, and and basically, okay, Zarabeth, played by Marion Hartley, is is lonely. It's a very heartbreaking story when you think about it because she has to. She fell in love with Spock. Spock fell in love with her. Nimoy's performance is incredible because he is he's so happy. I've never seen Spock so happy. And it's a natural kind of happiness. There's nothing artificial or chemical about this. I want to. I want to go back. I want to go back to that first episode because again, it's like it's early on, and he's still kind of learning Spock. Yeah. And learning, he's a little more sort of pissed off, cranky Spock. Like he's a little. He seemed like like he gets very impatient with people in that episode, if I remember correctly. Like he's very in the in the, uh, in the naked time. Naked time. He's right. very okay. curt with people. Well, he's and, crying. Right, he's yeah. crying, and then Kirk comes in and, and and he says, "My mother, I could never tell her I love her." Mm -hmm. uh, and then and then when Kirk is like trying to smack some sense into him, he gets really pissed off and smacks him mm -hmm. so hard that Kirk is bleeding from his mouth a little bit. <laughs> so it's 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 yeah, there is a very there's a very tenuous hold on his emotions, but I thought in this episode. All our yesterdays. It was just wonderful to see him kind of cut. He cuts loose a few times in the season, but he has to. And then, and then there's this sacrifice thing because Zarabeth has to give him up for his own good because it's going to kill them. Because the mystery Taz and uh, what's his name, the Inquisitor, say that if you're not properly prepared for the time that you're supposed to be going back to, you'll die. Like well, within also, hours. he kind of he tries to doesn't he try to like stay back, but. Uh, like he, he does, can't. yeah, yeah. He pushes McCoy, McCoy. can't go through without him. Like yeah. he, can't, he can't, yeah, yeah. So, so he was he was prepared to actually just throw McCoy through so he could spend Jesus. the rest of his life with the. Um, See what women will do to you. 
Fuck up your life. I mean, the thing is, I mean, Jesus Christ, she's really hot. She's freaking oh, yeah. hot. <laughs> she's a little skinny, but she's hot, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's eating meat, and he's doing all these crazy things he shouldn't be doing. But uh, mm-hmm. they they get back in, and it's just, it's 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 a it's it's for for the the lack of money that they had at the end of this oh, show. Rem- they did I a rem- fine job, I think. Atos escapes. He's like, oh, you got an escape plan. Uh. Yeah, and he was like, and they were like, what what the hell is he doing? And then he Kirk, runs out, pew, and he goes through the thing. Kirk tells him he had his escape planned. I'm glad he made it. And they leave. Uh, they get out right in the nick of time, right before. The planet explodes. This is a fantastic episode. It's, it is one of my favorites. I really do enjoy it quite oh, a bit. Okay. It's very, it's very heartbreaking think, at the end, especially when she's looking at them before they leave. That's wonderful. I think, I think the thing that makes me take it down a little bit is just the the, the general cheapness of it and the fact that, like again, uh, you know, uh, they only had the one set that they could they, use. They, the one set, the one sound stage, like, rather. It looks like a very low. It looks like an episode of Stargate. You know, it's like. <laughs> On set, they're gonna go through a thing, and then they're gonna show up someplace. That's it's, mean. And then, and then, and then, and it's like when they get there in the in like the frozen area, it looks like it, it looks like every other set. They just kind of made it all blue, and it's all styrofoam. And yeah, yeah. And then, you have been listening to Ship to Ship, a Star Trek podcast, with your hosts David Lawler and David B. Anderson. To find out more about us, subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit us at www.blissville.net or on Facebook at Misadventures in Blissville. Good night. Good night.